Uh, right now, though, um, Peter Melson is going to be our mini speaker of the day. Peter learned to fly in the early 50s at Maylands with the Royal Aero Club. He's maintained his licence ever since. He's been an aircraft owner for a fair bit of that time. He owned a Mooney for quite some number of years. Currently, he spends time gloating over 182, which still smells uh, leathery inside because it's so new. He's uh, very happy with that. Uh, he's been a commercial pilot for many, many years. He was mixed up in aircraft sales uh, with Australian Aviation, and uh, then he went into commerce and uh, dealt with serious matters in commerce. Uh, but Peter's going to tell you all about the what he knows of the last flight of James Clay. Peter, would you like to come forward, please? Yep. 20th of November 1970, James Clay, aged 42, and Miss Helen Arvins, aged 23, de departed Bankstown in Clay's turbocharged Cessna 320 Model D for Kulangana. And all intents disappeared off the face of the earth for 14 years. The wreckage only being discovered in 1984, almost to the day on the 21st of November. And let me give you some background. You might say, who was James Clay? James was a well-known businessman in Perth in the 1950s and 60s. He, he and his brother Alf operated a car importing business known as Clay Motors. And if those of you remember the old Stirling Highway days when down opposite the Windsor Hotel in Stirling Highway, he had his big showroom. Indeed, he was so successful that he also went into property developing and expanded to the Eastern States. Having done that, he was spending all his time flying to the Eastern States and indeed chartering aircraft up and down the coast looking at properties. In the early 1970s, he decided that he'd had enough of hiring and he wanted to do it himself. So he learnt to fly. And at the, something with 70 hours on the clock, he decided he would buy his own plane. So he buys, believe it or not, a Cessna 320. He moved straight out from Tiger Moths into 172s one, one and straight on to a 320. At the time, I was employed as involved with Cessna sales with the twin engine fleet with West Australian Aviation. And Ken Hammond was the manager. And he obviously had something to do with the sale because one of the conditions was that James would uh, have his training done with Ken. Ken insisted that he do 10 hours at least, which is fair enough given the lack of experience he had. But he was very good, he was very meticulous. And Ken gave him his endorsement, but at the same time he wanted to fly straight away to the Eastern States and relocate the aircraft at Bankstown so he could use it every time he went over to the east. His family wouldn't let him go by himself, so they insisted that somebody went with him, and as I was due to go to a, a course on the new Cessna 402 at Rex Aviation in Bankstown, they said, uh, asked me would I go with him as, I guess, uh, escort or accompanying pilot. We did that. Now, I haven't got on the board here yet, but let's have it. That's the man himself, <coughs> you may recall. On the trip itself, um, Jim did the flying and uh, I did the navigation and the, the radio work. On the, my logbook shows that on November the 17th, Ken Hammond gave me an hour's duel just to get me accustomed to, uh, to the aircraft. And on Wednesday the 18th, we departed Jandakot for Kalgoorlie at 3.30 in the afternoon. And the trip was to be from Jandakot to Bankstown. It so turned out that when we went to Bankstown, on the following day, Jim wanted to go to Coolangatta. So therein lies the story. If I could now read from my original report submitted to DCA at the time, and recall it was DCA in those days, and I would prefer to read because it's pertinent to the issues that came about. 
We left Kalgoorlie about 5 a.m. and came straight through to, to Bankstown via Siduna and Mildura. We entered controlled airspace Sydney at approximately 35 DME Sydney on a direct track Rugby Camden to Bankstown. During this period we were, we were obliged to obtain descent clearance to maintain VMC and during the period of request and approval entered heavy rain and possible stratus cloud at which time Mr. Clay had difficulty in maintaining lateral stability, heading and altitude and, and I was obliged on several occasions to take corrective action. Also entering the circuit of Bankstown under heavy rain showers, Mr. Clay had the tendency to climb on his turn indicating his inability to monitor the VSI. The following day he advised his intention of proceeding to, to Coolangatta now remember, my task was over. My job was to get him safely to Bankstown. But he then wanted to fly to, to Coolangatta. And advised he was taking Miss, Miss Helen Arvins with him, asked me, asked me to go and I said I couldn't because I was involved with Rex at, at the time. We had lunch at the Aero Club and anticipating an early departure, I helped him with his flight plan. And I stayed on here I offered to assist him with flight planning. This was completed at approximately 3.30 p.m., during which time we noted last light at Coolangatta was at 6.46, and that's on Eastern Standard Time. I'm converting from GMT here. His track time was 116 minutes, let's say two hours, with an estimated time of departure at 4 o'clock with start time nominated at 6.15. We discussed between ourselves and with the briefing office of various airspace restrictions en route and Mr. Clay elected to plan at 1500 feet Bankstown to, no to Nobby's Head, 500 feet coastal under the Williamtown airspace through to Sugarloaf Point and thence continue coastal at 1500 feet to Bellina and then direct to, to Kulangatta. I queried the en route winds and area forecast to ensure that he was satisfied and I personally cited the area forecast 25, noting the appropriate winds for his assigned altitude and flight planning purposes. I cannot recall noting any weather extremes, although I know I made a positive check on the cloud-based min minimums. I asked him if he had obtained the TAF and although I don't recall his words, he was obviously satisfied with the forecast. I then walked with him and Miss Arvins to the aircraft, assist him, assisted him in the pre-flight, made specific reference to him at that time and to ensure that any airspace entries based on DME should be confirmed visually with the aid of his whack chart because on the way over to Satuna from Perth uh, we noticed a discrepancy in the reading. I emphasised to him at the time that he should be flying coastal to keep the coast on his left because if he ran into weather the worst thing would be to turn left into the high country, the safest thing would be to turn right out to sea because as you realise in a twin if you bank to the right the cabin goes down hard to see the horizon, he couldn't monitor the panel so he'd have to lean forward to peer through the windscreen. The left turn was easy because the window's right alongside. This is Jim in the cockpit of his aircraft. This is the aircraft itself on the, on the flight over. The problem I had with Jim was to convince him that he should, if he ran into trouble, was to turn around and come back. Now I know he was very meticulous, I refer to it in my my report here, he was very thorough, he handled the aircraft well, but he lacked experience. The sad part is, and I read on here, I, I can't find, find it, but I walked out, I walked, left him and walked over to the Rex Aviation hangar. I left him at about five to four, expecting him to taxi out straight away. I walked out of the Rex Aviation hangar at 20 past four, and I suddenly saw him taxiing. 
I looked at my watch and thought, goodness gracious, he's running close on, on his sar time. And I had an intention then, and to this very day I regret not doing it. I had the intention, I thought I should walk to the tower and tell him to ask Jim to reconsider this trip. <clears throat> I stood there thinking about it, and I didn't do it. Jim then took off about 4.30, and that's the last he was seen off. That was the track the newspaper showed in the paper, but the critical issue were these times, because last night at Coolangatta was at 6.46. He was expected to leave Bankstown at 4 o'clock. With a two-hour track time, it means he would have been there at 6 o'clock with a start time of 6.15. His actual departure was 4.30, and therefore his ETA at Coolangatta would have been 6.30 with only 15 minutes of last light left. I gather, and what I have since found out, that when the wreck was found, the crash site was only 25 DME south of Coolangatta and he had turned inland because of showers instead of turning out to sea. In 1984, this was the headlines in the West Australian, and it refers to another chap with myself. That's a comment made at the time, and indeed, he caught at 52 DME when in fact he wasn't, he was only 25. And some comments by some Asian guys at the time. The sad part was that when I returned, I'll go back a bit, after it happened, I, of course, stayed there for a week with the search centre. I believed he had gone into the sea. Um, I had no understanding that he would have turned left to go into the hills. The, the tragedy was that was obviously, for him, the easiest turn. I had then come back to Perth and sit into a family gathering with all his family and, and relatives and explain what had happened what went wrong. I was suffering a little bit from huge guilt issues about not trying to stop the flight, but as Ken Hammond said to me, he said, your task was finished when you delivered him safely to Bankstown. He was a qualified pilot. He knew what he should be doing. He was quite capable of flying his plane, and indeed it was just a straight out VFR flight up the coast. Of course, it didn't turn out to, to be that way, because Apparently, when he was taxiing to take off, they advised him that the TAF at Coolangatta had changed and low cloud was forecast with rain. That's the man. It's a sad story. Um, I as I said, I've carried that for some years. It wasn't until 1984 when the wreck was, was discovered that I finally virtually put the thing at rest. But uh, it's uh, just one of those things that that, that can happen, and unfortunately I was part of the process. Thank you very much.